for the Thorndon Overbridge. That overbridge is the main transportation route in and out of Wellington, a crucial lifeline in a disaster. Now, the Wellington Fault actually crosses under the roadway. And unfortunately, the columns were built to a code that was shown to be deficient. New Zealand engineers came up with several innovative solutions. They put some big steel jackets around the columns to add extra support for the columns. A number of the columns are on liquefiable soil, and they've increased the liquefaction resilience, tied the columns back to each other, put deeper piles in. Now, at the top of the columns, the roadway is sitting on a seat. Now, before the retrofit, the seat was rather small, so it didn't take much movement for the roadway to drop. So the original construction wasn't likely to handle the intense shaking expected right on the rupture zone. And what they've done is put the steel catchers at the top of the columns, and that's so when the fault moves, the roadway will be caught and stay at the same level, and that'll help reoccupy this bridge after the event. Other breakthrough seismic solutions out of New Zealand targeted building technology, and Te Papa is a famous example of one of them, base isolation. Base isolating is actually keeping the building isolated from the ground, because what happens in an earthquake, you get this great big hammer blow, um, like a sledgehammer blow, and the ground moves. And if your building is rigidly fixed to it, the building moves as well. But if you can isolate it, what happens is the inertia of the building just keeps it there while the ground goes bang, like that. And so it doesn't take the shock that the ground is trying to put into it. But if you can base isolate it, you can actually take out as much as 80% of the shock. It's what the ancient Greeks were doing when they built some of their temples on gravels and animal skins. But it was a New Zealand scientist, Bill Robinson, who heralded in the modern era of base isolation. What he came up with was the idea of having this big block of rubber, drilling a hole through the middle and putting a lead core in it so that when it um, displaced, the energy was absorbed by the lead and it actually sort of turned plastic and um, it could deform and absorb energy. And they allow the building to float um, with, with semi-contact with the ground. Built for New Zealand's Ministry of Health in 1982, this was the first building in the world to use this technology. It's a technology widely accepted in California and Japan. In Japan, tenants will pay 10% more to live in a base-isolated building. Yet only 10 buildings in New Zealand have been base-isolated, and only one in Christchurch. That is the only building in the South Island that's been designed and built with base isolation. And that building stayed open and functional through all the earthquakes that we've had. And, you know, you go across the river and there's, they'll be lucky if 10% of the buildings in town will be left standing. Everyone thinks it's expensive, but it's not. You can actually design a base isolated building five to 10% cheaper than a conventional building. Whereas base isolation allows the ground to move beneath the building, another cutting edge New Zealand technology allows the building to move with the earthquake and then return to its original shape. If we think about two boxers punching each other, the worst way to get a punch is just to go straight into the punch. The best way is to use the dynamics of that and basically moving as much as possible together with the punch. The technology was extensively tested at the University of Canterbury before the earthquakes began. This building went through months of testing, subjecting the building through many, many earthquakes of the type of February, if not even stronger, and we couldn't break it. It's a design based on flexibility. By combining together elements, uh, prefabricated blocks, uh, and tying uh, a big, high-strength uh, steel. Under pressure, steel behaves like elastic. It's uh, like a rubber band, tying that strongly to make them 
working one against each other, then you have a very, very strong system, but it's not strong and brittle. Should the earthquake being uh, bigger than what you've been tying your elements one against each other for, then you're simply going to go for the ride. And the ride looks uh, the Greek temple rocking motion. Back and forth, back and forth, you can't break it. The other component is a sort of fuse, so that if the building's overloaded, it breaks where it's meant to. The additional feature to make really capacity design the next generation of system is uh, the possibility of using a fuse. You see, it's basically weaker over here, so we want to be sure that we know exactly where the fuse is going to break, like an electrical fuse. And under the earthquake, these elements, which we call a plug and play, because it's easy to put in and put out, is going to stretch back and forth. The steel is going to act as plastic material. Basically, the critical famous fuse is going to be over here. And if we do it properly under the earthquake, this fuse is going to absorb all the energy and sacrifice itself under many aftershocks. So you might want to take it, replace it, and then change it maybe with a stronger fuse. This is what the new building technology can actually provide, a solution which is capable of replacing the damaged element in a cost-effective manner. And the end user, which are basically the tenant, the building owners, people living in houses, should be asking, tell me more about these shock absorbers. The more they're going to ask for it, the more the price is going to go down. New Zealand is renowned for innovative seismic technology and design. This, combined with the lessons learned from the tragic events of February 22, 2011, could work to increase everyone's safety when the next earthquake inevitably strikes. No one can ignore the risk of living on a plate boundary, but the combination of a modern city, an unusually destructive earthquake, and a strong tradition of seismic engineering has produced potentially life-saving information for one of the first times in New Zealand at least, we have an extremely good data set where we, we can really understand right from the earthquake source all the way through to the consequences in terms of many different metrics to society. So for instance, we can define what sort of ground accelerations are required to trigger rock falls, to cause rocks to break apart in situ, in place, to cause liquefaction in some areas but not in others. Uh, and it is going to lead to decades of world-leading research. This research feeds into the global knowledge gained from other destructive earthquakes, lessons learned from tragedy that change policies such as building codes in order to improve people's safety. But changing the policy doesn't necessarily change the building. The building that failed in Christchurch, costing the most lives, was built using a structural system in common use in the 70s and 80s until it was proven unsafe in the California and Kobe earthquakes in the mid-90s. Now, both of these earthquakes were similar to the Christchurch earthquake in terms of shaking, and what we observed in these earthquakes is this type of construction doesn't perform well under earthquakes. And that was enough to cause us to change the regulations in the design code for New Zealand buildings. But when the code changes, most owners are only legally obliged to bring their buildings up to over 33%. That's one third of the code. So the buildings remain vulnerable in the event of a big earthquake. 34% of the building code is not easy to determine, but for me personally, I would be unhappy to have um, anybody that I know working in a building less than two thirds of the building code. There is no magic figure though, and I think um, from Christchurch we learned that there were buildings that did collapse, CTV and Pangal Guinness, that, were, that would not have been described as earthquake prone. So it does mean that we've got to be careful and, and assess buildings, particularly um, the CTV building was built in 1986, so it would be assumed to be safer than perhaps it was. Christchurch was obviously a harsh lesson in this case, so really that requires us to re-examine these buildings and decide how vulnerable they are and potentially require that they be retrofitted. The construction plans for hundreds of buildings are under review. They've done what's called an IEP, um, an initial look at the building from the plans to see whether they're at risk. 
and then they've assessed whether they're earthquake prone from more detailed structural assessments in some instances. Seismologists living in New Zealand are aware that the next earthquake is only a matter of time. Earthquakes happen in a great big smudge that occurs right down the east coast of the North Island, right th down to Fiordland. So big earthquakes can be generated anywhere through that smudge zone, and we have to be prepared for those. And I think what Christchurch taught us is that a significant earthquake can go wham, hit you, and there's not much you can do about it at the time. Everybody knows that we live on an active plate boundary. Um, it's why New Zealand's beautiful. Um, but you know, we know that there are risks, earthquake hazards, landslides, volcanoes, tsunami. For me personally, I would say that you should not be worried. You should be aware. You, we need to have knowledge. We need to be prepared. And in the event of a tsunami, being prepared means not wasting any time. If you feel um, an earthquake that is shaking uh, very strongly for 20 seconds or more, very strongly meaning it's hard to stand up, that is an earthquake that is potentially very near. Uh, and in Wellington particular, anywhere along the east coast of the North Island, that means you have to get out. You don't wait for anybody to tell you to get out. You don't turn on your radio. You've got about 10 minutes to get away from the coast and up high. The inevitability of earthquakes should also influence where we choose to build. Moderate-sized earthquakes, like Christchurch, can occur anywhere including directly on previously unknown faults right beneath urban centres. At some level, there's not a lot we can do about those earthquakes happening, but there are decisions that we can make in our built-up environments to make us more resilient to those earthquakes should they occur. Having appropriate setback distances from major cliff faces, for instance. Setting aside areas that are vulnerable to liquefaction, perhaps creating corridors for parks and things like that, as opposed to, to building houses on those areas. And some building technologies are far more likely to survive earthquakes than others. We can't, by definition, change the frequency of earthquakes. We are, do, not, do not have that toolkit as yet as a human being. But what we can do is to minimize as much as possible the vulnerability of the built environment where we're living in. We are being engaged by the international community, and when I say community, it's not only the scientific community, it's the policy-making people, it's the high-level governance. Think about how could we learn from the lessons that we have been facing in Christchurch. We can't afford taking down completely a full city. Can we in the future have a damage-free building? We are getting there. The good news is that we have technology that can go through an earthquake, huh? Basically, after the earthquake, we are going to stay in, the, uh, in our desk, being shaken, but continue the work, the work as usual, and hopefully enjoy the buildings again for another few decades. It is possible in the third millennium to construct buildings in that way. Gannets have a problem. It's hard to catch sardines on your own. He comes up with nothing. But they have found a solution. They've teamed up with the dolphins. They attack from below, breaking up the shoals and driving them to the surface. Now the sardines are much easier to catch. See the world from a bird's eye view. There is an uneasy alliance.